uh, seminal contributions perhaps in uh, whichever sector they are placed in right now. So uh, after that, I'll probably give some of my um, you know, observations and comments on the theme, which I've been asked to give by Professor Kumar. And then we open uh, the floor for discussion and we expect students, uh, especially students, uh, comments and observations on what uh, we've done in this session. And uh, uh, we allow the, uh, the speakers to respond to the questions that will be put to them. So this being the format, may I now request uh, Professor Mukherjee, we can hear you. So you would you start? If you can hear us, you should be the first one to start and then Dr. Gitanjali will follow. You get a 20 minutes to speak. So Professor Mukherjee, if you're able to hear me. Uh, he I can hear us now start. on YouTube. So, so I think he'll have to unmute himself first. Uh, please unmute uh, Professor Mukherjee. The same icon that you used earlier to unmute yourself. And then Dr. Gitanjali. Yes, now, now we can. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. You get 20 yeah. minutes to speak. So, Professor Mukherjee, if you're able to hear me, uh, you can hear us now on YouTube. Yes. I, so, I can. so I think he'll have to unmute himself first. I'll have to I, unmute, uh, Can you hear me? He, he has unmuted. Yes, please, we please can let hear him, you. Let, let, him, let, him, let him speak, please. Yeah, yeah. But I have used I have used the unmute yeah. icon, but can you hear me? Yes, now now we can. Yeah. Excellent. So you have to speak. Excellent. So Mukaji, if you're able to hear me, uh I hear us now. Uh, Professor Mukherjee, what you can do is you can uh, unmute there. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, so you can I, mute I'm, there. I'm, I'm living in, in a the very peculiar Google. internet world right now where I can only hear you on YouTube and you can hear me on Google Meet. But I'm really not very surprised that this has happened to me because my relationship with technology has never been a good one. And it always <laughs> sort of protests whenever I try to use it. And uh, uh -huh. that has just reiterated itself, you know, this propensity of technological gadgets to have a problem interacting with me. But however, I think Professor Narendra Kumar has been uh, very gracious. He has found uh, the Jugaad techniques to get me out of this problem. And thank you, Professor Basu, for your very uh, warm and generous introduction. I am sure I don't deserve to be in this panel, but uh, but it is a very sentimental journey for me to uh, talk about uh, my days in CPS, and I have actually written a short piece. Therefore, I will be reading from there, and hopefully it will be covered in whatever 15. I never timed it, so I hope it will be in 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, here it goes. I think you can all hear me. CPS arrived at the just at the right moment in 2003 when I was wondering whether I would succeed as a teacher and a scholar in India. Upon return to India in 1999 with a PhD in political science from Columbia, I had spent two years at the Center for Policy Research, followed by a year and a half at the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation. I was beginning to worry. Did I work towards a PhD for academic pursuits? Or was the degree pursued to attract media attention to become a notable Indian with excellent contacts? I had had a ringside view of the policy community and the media at that time. I also found that it was easier to be a practitioner, a journalist, or a public intellectual than to evolve as a scholar in Delhi. Good academic jobs were few in those days, and political science departments cared less about political economy and public policy. It was much easier to find an academic job if you were working in other areas. On the other hand, I was deeply concerned that, that the economy and policymaking were a deeply political process. This had hardly attracted the attention of scholars devoted to the study of politics in those days. I therefore thought I could contribute in a small way by just quietly doing the work rather than writing quick journalistic pieces. A lot of very bright people were doing just that. What do I mean by the right moment? 
By the right moment, I mean that I came with unusual preparation and I needed CPS to evolve. Was my preparation unusual? It was unusual because the CPS faculty was more exposed to politics training in India and Britain rather than the US in those days. My politics training at the School of International Studies with a smattering of courses at the Center for Political Studies with professors Kaviraj, Bhargav, and Jayal. Then exposure to a PhD program in political science at Columbia obviously produced a species that could easily become a loner academic in those days. Like most returnees from the US, I was somewhat arrogant regarding my training. This training, which involved two years of coursework followed by a comprehensive exam, was quite different from the British approach. In Britain, you can start writing a thesis with much less preparation. Moreover, there was much more science in the politics scholarship in the US. Despite the rationalist and quantitative temptation for job seekers in the US in those days, I had argued for the importance of ideas and historical paths. This was a time when this kind of an approach to the study of political economy and public policy in India was rare for political science scholars, even though the Indian economy was undergoing a deep transformation. My preparation was unusual also because I did not come from a university department. I had secured jobs at government departments at Dartmouth and Georgetown respectively when I decided to return to India in 1999. I had been teaching regularly since 1996 at Hunter College at Columbia at the University of Vermont as a graduate student and at Columbia University. This experience convinced me that I would not like to stay away from teaching for a long time. Little had I then realized that it would be an uphill task to secure an academic position in Delhi. I had to spend three and a half postdoctoral years at the Center for Policy Research, 91 to two, uh, 1999 to 2001, and then at the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation from 2001 till 2003. Frustrating though the experience was, I had gained during this period an almost anthropologist's understanding of the policy process in India. These organizations enabled me to work closely with persons who had been located very close to the process of policy making. The point I'm trying to make here is that I was very frustrated and deeply worried about the exposure to the policy environment devoid of much scholarly content between 1999 and 2003. I had two failed job interviews in Delhi. There was some kind of a rumor that I was too queer and somewhat arrogant to find a place in a good academic department. All this came with the remorse that I would be reduced to a policy wonk, something that I had not worked for in all these years. Little did I realize then that this was a kind of baptism by fire. I was gaining valuable insight by the dint of destiny rather than by design. Had Lady Luck shown upon me in the expected manner, I could have joined the School of International Studies or the Politics Department in, De in Delhi University or the University of Texas or even the University of Amsterdam. Jobs I could have secured during this period which did not come my way for a variety of reasons. Joining CPS in 2003, therefore, was more than a dream come true. It was a turning point. CPS enabled me to breathe the freedom, freedom that tenure gives when you, after a year, uh, when you become permanent in the institution. I enjoyed that freedom. I really understood what it meant. I would never have felt this way had I not graduated to a JNU position after contractual jobs at policy think tanks, where even the best ones do not grant that kind of liberty to explore your intellectual self. CPR and RGF had also earned me the kind of experience that I would have not gained in a purely teaching institution. Had one accepted the Georgetown job before joining JNU, one would have ruthlessly applied Western models to bask in the glory of some kind of erudition. CPR and RGF did two things. First, we were always discussing policies. Second, I had no access to really good libraries for some time. I also had scarce academic resources, which precluded me 
from attending any big conference in the US, barring few exceptional area studies meetings that paid for my travel. At any rate, I was busy trying to save my intellectual soul in a policy environment. There was no time to explore funding to attend a big conference. This engendered a situation where one came steeped in a tradition and soon thereafter, one had to engage the policy community looking at real policy issues without the benefit of access to good libraries. I joined the center with Professor Zoya Hassan as chair along with wonderful colleagues, Professors Valerian Rodriguez, Vidhu Verma, Pralai Kanungo, Shefali Jha, Asha Sarindi, and T.G. Suresh. Earlier, Professor Gurpreet Mahajan had encouraged me to apply to CPS after a presentation at the University of Michigan in 2002. I was skeptical of securing an academic job in Delhi then. But encouragement did, did help me make up my mind. The result was the pleasantest surprise. The warmth with which I was welcomed in CPS made me feel that there was light at the end of the struggle. I could now reason why I had failed to secure the earlier jobs. I would not then have been privileged enough with an insider's perspective at the country's premier department that attracted the best students. These five years in JNU enabled me to make the transition to academic life in India in its pristine form. I carry a small, small part of that JNU wherever I go. Destiny thus led me to CPS after having experienced it as a student from the School of International Studies, then spending six years in the United States, and thereafter, spending three years in policy think tanks. Neither did I know what citations were, nor did I care. The geographical distance from the US made it tougher to attend big conferences or get published in the best journals. But there was no pressure of a tenure track job in the United States. Everyone was permanent after a year's service. I was therefore able to think freely about the policy process with the historians and an anthropologist's instinct. This is very important for political scientists. Phenomena such as Donald Trump and Hindutva nationalism appear sudden only because we do not track historical processes, often trying to fit our data or narrative to certain models rather than the other way around. I quickly learned that the best part of CPS are its students. I must have bored them to death by my rather crass understanding of how a science of politics that had evolved in the US could be relevant for the study of international relations and political economy in India. One was lucky to be reflecting on India from within. I had begun to develop a skepticism for standard explanations regarding many phenomena that required a different lens. I tried to expose students to the comparative method that was both systematic science, but needed engagement with history. I tried to reason that while quantitative methods have their place, there are a number of research objectives that cannot be achieved by quantification. We engage the logic of quantitative methods to reason whether qualitative methods also have a significant place. I have fond memories of taking the MA methodology class to, J to Jammu and to Hyderabad. During both visits, Professor Vidhu Verma was a co-conspirator, even though she was not teaching this class. The whole idea was to expose students to systematic empirical inquiry that would make it easy for them to challenge conventional wisdom. What we read in the books as standard appears so real, partly only because it has been well argued. I wanted students to ask systematic questions to persons on the ground selected through a rough sampling procedure to judge whether the standard arguments hold. I also wanted them to understand that nobody will tell you anything unless they trust you. Getting feedback in the field is also about creating social relationships and trust. To give just a few examples, if Putnam and Varshne were to be believed, Jammu should have had fewer rights because of social capital. If Wilkinson was right, then political competition pr would provide the clues. If, however, Paul Brass were to be believed, then we should witness the emergence of a theater of violence. While one was scared with launching this experiment, the results surpassed our expectations. Students learned how to challenge conventional wisdom, and often our hosts conceded that no one had covered the field with such passion. 
We never published anything though, because this methods class came in the last semester of the MA program, CPS's flagship program. We did share some of our data with our hosts who had been very gracious. CPS could, in those days, entrust such a responsibility to a young assistant professor who had just arrived. This is also a time for me to remember the presence of the late Sri Jamal Ahmed, our senior technical officer, whose affection is not easy for me to forget. He was the one who gave me private lessons regarding the history of CPS and its old tradition. I have always been absent-minded and a bit of a blunderbuss. He would make sure that I would never overspend and would present bills in an acceptable manner. It helped us a great deal that our hosts, Professor Amitabh Mattu in JNU and Professor Shanta Sinha in Hyderabad, provided us with amenities that made us comfortable beyond our limited budgets. The library had a limited holding that would easily get misplaced. I would first buy a personal copy and then photocopy chapters for students. The library books would finally make their way to the reference section of the library. So students could not complain that they did not have access to reading materials. A former student who is now teaching at the Azim Premji University was quite shocked when I remembered a particular answer she had provided in the IR class. Another student who is an influential editor with the Hindu reminded me that he was also in my class after publishing an opinion piece. I am sure that they have all done very well. There was also the sheer joy of conducting research without the pressure of project funding. In 2004, I was invited by Francine Frankel and Sunil Kilnani for two separate conferences in the US. Francine agreed to convert my airfare into an honorarium. Given another honorarium and airfare that came from Sunil's position at the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, I afforded a six week research stay at Columbia's Institute of War and Peace. My teacher, Jack Snyder, planned such that I could use the legendary Ken Walsh's office while he was away in Maine during the summer. This defining moment came after I had spent about a year in JNU. Uh, these two papers were an in inspiration that drove me to research infrastructure sectors such as power and telecommunications. I had a ringside view of the policy process in India and visiting Colombia would enable me to access scholarly resources that I had not seen since 1999. This was also a time when physical distance from the US had made me skeptical regarding American journals. I had begun to tell myself, why bother? I worked hard in India and at the Institute of War and Peace, trying to make some sense of how the infrastructure sectors were evolving in India. The location in JNU was just perfect. And the six weeks at War and Peace provided me with the opportunity to think deeply about these issues. At the Washington conference, I met Monte Kaluvalia, director then of the IMF's Independent Evaluation Office. He was a discussant for my paper. That paper, which he discussed, was not only published in India Review, it became the foundation for some work that I did for the World Bank as an independent consultant. That paper and a work and the work that I did for the bank handsomely contributed to chapters in globalization and deregulation. Francine's conference at Penn was an even more challenging proposition. She had approached the Journal of Asian Studies for a special issue. I decided to write one on India's telecom transformation. As luck would have it, that special issue with the likes of Pratap Mehta, Devesh Kapoor, Alan Heston, and Anjini Kocher was rejected by the journal. But the journal wanted me to revise and resubmit. Moreover, after the journal rejected Francine, she had turned to the Journal of Development Studies as another possibility. Since JS had rejected Francine's conference, I had to write a separate new paper that would fit the bill for JDS. At this time, I had published in Pacific Affairs and in India Review. But this trip to the US forced me to send papers that were published in the Journal of Asian Studies and the Journal of Development Studies, respectively. I had been forced to approach journals that I would never have sought on my own. I must thank Francine, Sunil, and Jack for making this possible. Such are the ways of academic life. Many years later, I tried to replicate a similar experience for younger scholars at the National University of Singapore. 
It was around this time that my friend Vikram Chand approached me to write a paper for the World Bank on India's telecom transformation as an independent consultant. I cautioned Vikram that there will be little praise for the bank in the one infrastructure sector where India had succeeded more than others. In fact, I told him that the government refused the World Bank every time they proffered advice. The bank, however, wanted to learn how India evolves through a plethora of complications and scandals to produce some semblance of order within what looks like an anarchical order. Being an independent consultant for the bank on two infrastructure projects gave me an unusual access to materials that one needs to consult before getting behind the real story. Such experiences help me understand why policy ideas often matter in ways that cannot be understood easily through class-based approaches to politics. Moreover, how is the capacity of the state impacted by policy paradigms that it buys into? The Ford Foundation through the, Institute of, to the, through the University of Pennsylvania Institute for the Advanced Study of India funded a couple of weeks of stay in Colombo and in Dhaka in 2003. I wrote a paper on regional integration arguing how India could enter into a preferential trading agreement with Sri Lanka in 2000, despite such a dismal experience of cooperation with its neighbors. These trips were an eye opener for me. I realized how lopsided is the view from Delhi regarding India's neighbors. Finally, JNU was the best place in the world to realize that India's growth, while quite impressive in those days, was not, lack, was not attacking the problem of poverty. I became curious about how the rights-based approach was born and why it could be implemented more efficiently in some states than others. Those were the days when we took democracy for granted. We used to worry more about growth and its impact on redistribution. Today, the question of India's democratic decline has become more significant. I do hope that the center will contribute seminal ideas that will spur India's democratic resurgence. Thank you very much for this, in, for this invitation. I think my 20 minutes are over. I hope you appreciate now why I hope I have been able to argue CPS was a turning point. My heartfelt thanks to all my colleagues who made this part of the scholarly journey possible. Thank you. And I will be able to hear you, I think, on, uh, on YouTube. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Mukherjee, for an excellent presentation. Uh, where will you uh, Can you hear me? Yes, Professor. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor thank you, Mukherjee. Professor. Is, there's an echo. I hope that doesn't continue. Uh, well, we could hear you, your entire presentation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, talking about your journey as a student, as well as your brief teaching experience in CPS, which enriched you in so many ways. It's just that, uh, you know, even the morning speakers uh, have said the same thing, which you also do say that CPS changed you in so many ways, not only by giving you the freedom and autonomy to take your own classes, experiment with the syllabi, and to be able to, uh, to have the kind of argumentative debates, you know, in, in diverse fora, uh, providing you with the tools that you use in later life. That's something that CPS trains you for. So I, I really appreciate, you know, you uh, sharing your experiences of CPS, your teachers, your students, how they changed your lives. Uh, and that's something very interesting, how students can, by giving their kind of inputs, also make you think, sit up as a teacher, work doubly harder, and try and answer their queries, their questions, the way uh, they want it to be answered. So thank you for speaking about the cumulative experience of being in JNU for a certain period of time as a research scholar in SIS and also as a teacher in CPS and how that changes and did change your uh, experiences uh, in academia. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. I would now request uh, Dr. Gitanjali Chaturvedi, uh, who was also a student in CPS, to uh, recount her experiences 
in her profession later on. Uh, and we are very eager to hear you because you, uh, you belong to another uh, sector in another profession. There are a lot of teachers and students here who belong to strictly to the academia, but you have a d different, a diverse set of experiences to share uh, with us. And uh, of course, your academic journey in CPS interests us. Uh, not uh, just uh, beyond anything else, but as a supplement to whatever you've done in later life. So Dr. Gitanjali Chaturvedi, you have about uh, 20 minutes at the most, you know, 15 to 20 minutes really. Yes. Certainly. So thank you again. And um, I would like to preface my uh, conversation by sincerely thanking Professor Narendra Kumar. And because it's really very exceptional and rare to actually have the opportunity to thank the, the center to commemorate and celebrate a 50th anniversary and also see your professor sitting across from you. Um, I see Professor Hassan. I, I just saw Professor Aurora. And, um, and it would have been great to share the stage with uh, Professor Jayal because she was my PhD supervisor, but it's unfortunate that she's not there. Uh, but, but really, this is a tribute to what the center has given me um, in these exceptional, um, the exceptional nine years that I spent doing an MA and then an MPhil and a PhD. I actually feel um, I had prepared something like Professor Mukherjee, but I think I'll just go extempore and supplement with my notes. Um, I actually feel that uh, my time at CPS was really like, um, a personal journey where I was exploring and understanding who I really was. Um, and, and for that, I think the courses that I took and, and because there was so much flexibility in what I could study and what I could pursue, the, the courses really helped me understand who I really was. So by the end of um, you know, my PhD submission, I knew certainly that I wanted to be a development professional. And that came to me during my conversations with Professor Aurora, Professor Hassan, of course, and of course, a lot of mentoring from Professor Jayal. Um, I was very interested in the environment. I was very interested in sustainable development. Um, I was particularly because I, I, I'm really fond of traveling, as all of us are. Um, I, I had a certain view of the world as well. We, I worked on the mountain um, landscape. So we worked on ecotourism for my PhD. Um, and, and I was quite certain that I wanted to walk the path of um, sustainability, of sustainable development, working with communities. And perhaps the civil service path was not for me because I had seen it up close, very close, because my father was a civil servant. Um, and and I, what I work with people and communities. Um, so, and, and I think what was also very prominent in how I had perceived what I wanted my career path to be was really to change the world and um, and I think I used to keep telling people that I really want to be part of that journey that sort of changes the world so I found myself working in these uh, programs that sound very impressive I mean the trying to eradicate polio um, being part of the poverty alleviation programs and trying to eliminate absolute poverty by 2030 and you know I, I keep thinking all right I did hitch my wagon on the right battles but did we really succeed I mean uh, you really prompted me by inviting me here to think about whether I really succeeded in impacting any change in the world um, because come to think of it we did eradicate polio in India but it still exists in Pakistan and Afghanistan um, I don't think we're anywhere close to eradicating poverty. And, um, and I've also worked in gender parity, and I think it's going to take over two decades, uh, sorry, <laughs> two centuries to achieve any kind of parity in the world. Um, so I, I really started to think, you know, are our priorities right? I mean, why are we fighting these battles that seem to never succeed? I mean, are we just... Are we just sort of looking at ways to employ ourselves indefinitely? What is the purpose of this whole development? And um, and I thought that for this conversation today, I would uh, we could discuss polio, we could discuss poverty, and we could also discuss gender parity if there's enough time. And how I feel we um, CPS influence the work that I do, and how I feel um, where I feel we could go. Um, so the first part is really polio. I mean. 
when I was working on Polio, I was just a rookie. I was very young. Um, it was my first proper job. I was working for UNICEF. And everybody I spoke to, right from the government to other partners who we were trying to engage, told me that pro polio was the wrong priority. And that kid, there weren't kids dying of polio. The only reason that we were actually pursuing this goal was because America had told us to do it, because there was a vaccine and because people were high from the success of the smallpox campaign that they wanted another disease to eradicate. Um, it really made no sense. It was also this vertical program, which meant that people who were working on polio just did polio. They didn't do anything else. And what was more important was to strengthen routine immunization and to, um, and to perhaps strengthen health systems in, um, in villages, in the primary healthcare centers. So it seemed like we were actually doing the wrong thing. And there was billions of dollars that was spent just, just in eradicating polio and doing round after round of polio drops. But somehow we succeeded. And I've often wondered why. And we succeeded in India because the government then finally felt that they had to do a push. We succeeded because we understood the community we were going to work in because there was a lot of resistance by the Muslim population in UP and Bihar. Um, because of the nature of the disease, it had become a, a disease of the poor. We, we actually did very targeted interventions, bringing in, um, you know, um, bringing, bringing in uh, interpersonal communicators in the communities who used to live there and they were almost all women. Uh, we also engaged with the imams and clerics and there was a lot of really hard work on the ground that went in. But what it told me, what it taught me was that in order to understand India, in order to actually achieve any success, we had to, we could not ignore caste. And the fact that a lot of conversions took place when they did. It didn't mean, whenever they historically did, it didn't mean that people didn't convert with their caste. So as I would look at the wild polio updates that would come every week, I would see every case being broken down by caste, by, by religion, by caste, by address. And we then knew how to target the disease better. So, and that's a tool that we use even today in tackling COVID-19, for example. Um, the third thing that I really learned was that the Indian state was basically all pervasive. Unless they didn't really buy into a program, we would have no success and we would just be, be seen as, you know, a WHO program, an American program, a UNICEF program and so on. It was, it was just not sustainable uh, without the support of the Indian state. And they got it done and they got it done really well. Um, I also realized that um, the third thing was the power of women, actually, which was very, very important because what we had was the, once we changed these vaccination teams to just women's teams with women vaccinators, women communicators, women surveyors, um, we actually achieved a lot more success because women could walk into kitchens, they could walk into bedrooms and pull out sleeping babies from cribs and vaccinate them. And no man in Western UP, for example, could achieve something like that. So that is what it taught me. And, and really, um, these were very early lessons that I learned over 15 years uh, ago. And with that, I went to, uh, to Afghanistan and Nigeria to to work on the polio campaign. I learned a lot from there, but then I came back to work on poverty alleviation with, um, with the World Bank. And it was that part I think was even more interesting for me because the polio campaign seemed like a big trailer, but the poverty alleviation campaign in India, especially is this big blockbuster that is still ongoing. And um, when I first started to work on the poverty campaigns, I realized I actually started working um, in the early 2000s, right after polio. And what was happening at that time um, was that, in fact, right after I left JNU, you know, what, what was going on was that we had, um, there was a very silent sort of, I wouldn't call it a revolution, but a very, um, very silent, remarkable transformation that was taking part in rural, a place in rural area, India. Um, once a week, women would meet in groups, um, they would pool in their savings um, and use that to leverage institutional credit for small businesses. And I traveled from village to village, state to state, and found these groups engaging in different activities. And even 
very often delivering the government's programs. Um, they were catering midday meals. Um, they were organizing pensions and meals for widows and destitute, as they called it. Um, they were supporting farmers, producers, organizations, procuring food, grain in bulk and selling them onto the mundis. And these groups were ubiquitous. Um, officials at the district level were actually using them to um, implement, they were channeling resources to implement other de development schemes, including M um, Enrega. And it was on the backs of these groups that India's millions were lifted out of poverty. In fact, between 2006 and 2016, the UNDP actually um, presented a report saying that India had broken all records and lifted about 271 million women, people out of poverty. Um, it was women's power that actually did that. And um, so shortly after this, when I started working on, um, on the poverty eradication program, these self-help groups had by then matured and they were no longer these artisanal groups, but they had become more competitive. Uh, there was a push to actually help them evolve into listed companies, become part of a global value chain and sell their products to um, Reliance, Walmart, Big Bazaar and so on. Um, so I was completely blinded. It was very hard to not be blinded by this shining rural India and to go from village to village and see ambition. Um, because the India that I had seen growing up was static and it was slow to change. And suddenly I saw these women wielding mobile phones and delivering orders in bulk and negotiating with transporters and vendors and, um, and filling out these complicated forms often online, you know. Um, they were calling customer care for help, for example, and uh, they had dis disposable income. They were sending their kids to school. Um, they had, often because of the land um, reforms that were also ongoing in these states where these poverty elevation programs were being implemented, they had uh, property in joint ownership with their husbands. And what I was working on to, was to scale these efforts um, beyond the few states where we'd seen success. Um, so what had started out in Andhra and Tamil Nadu, then sort of spilled over to Orissa, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, um, Maharashtra, Bihar. Um, and, and during the time that I joined, the Ministry for Rural Development was also um, pushing this through the no National Rural Livelihoods Mission or the NRLM. Um, the model of using women's groups to enhance um, household incomes was uh, basically the foundation for achieving uh, poverty elimination. And, but this was not just new to India, it was borrowed from Pakistan, also influenced by the Grameen Bank model in Bangladesh. And during that time, I had the privilege of actually working in all South Asian countries, seeing these groups in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in, um, in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, in Afghanistan. And we organized several knowledge learning and exchanging uh, knowledge exchange um, sort of um, trips to uh, help people to understand what approaches would work. Um, and this was actually the first time that I felt that South Asian countries could work together. And this is also uh, to uh, Professor Mukherjee's point that South Asian countries could actually work together and share models that had worked and com combat multidimensional poverty together. But there was one flaw I felt in the entire model. And that's what sort of... Um, I, I think br brought it down as well, because what happened was in their enthusiasm to en enhance livelihoods and increase incomes and influence markets, all these poverty alleviation projects put tremendous pressure on women and their time. And almost exclusively, they were designed by men. One of the key components of these projects was for women to um, invest in livestock um, and dairy so that they would enhance their income and their nutrition. But what these government officials had sort of overlooked completely was that the burden of caring for an animal who is often a buffalo and stronger and larger than a woman was actually adding to her, you know, the additional household chores and domestic duties that women would uh, take care of, uh, would undertake at the cost of their leisure and at the cost of their rest. Um, they somehow didn't think that men would chip in. So they designed a program that was far too heavy on the women. Um, there was one more problem. By the time I came in, I discovered that with 10 years into the South African group movement, girls were already staying longer in schools and nursing career ambitions. They didn't dream of owning um, 
a dairy farm or tending to cattle. They wanted white collar jobs. They wanted lives in cities and they wanted to postpone their marriage and dreamt of romantic love. So what was holding them back? And when I put that question to them, they said it was the men. Um, and that actually got me to transition from studying, not just working in poverty, but actually understanding women's aspirations. And I studied that for a long time with the bank. And um, I tried to understand how programs to increase um, female labor force participation actually fell short because we were not providing them or creating conditions um, that would enable them to work in areas that they were interested in. Um, we were almost really sort of forcing women to be um, to find low paying part time jobs and they were being relegated to the informal sector as it was assumed um, that their incomes would only supplement family income. Um, <clears throat> It was interesting in Tamil Nadu, there was a lot of women who, uh, young girls who were sent off to the ready-made garment industry. And when they went to work in these factories in Tamil Nadu, they were encouraged by their employers to invest in gold for their marriage. Um, I researched aspirations in um, Indian states that were low income, middle income and high income. And all my research revealed that women wanted the same things as men. They wanted full-time jobs, they wanted assets and they wanted self-respect. Um, so it was this disconnect actually that pushed me to um, understanding, you know, gender parity and and also the fact that India was steadily dropping in the gender gap index, the global gender gap in the index. Uh, female labor force participation was among the lowest in the world. And what was even more significant was uh, women's representation in parliament. And um, then I think, I think as I continued to study it, all the facts continued to shock me even more. Um, what was even more shocking was sex ratio at birth. And I know that the present audience will probably not be as surprised, but um, the sum met of preference was discussed at length in the economic survey in 2018. And what we discovered there was that educated urban women living in nuclear families was self-selecting having a second child only if the first was a girl. So one did not need to practice female feticide to skew sex ratio at birth. There were 21 million unwanted girls in the, daughters in the country. And women obviously appeared to enforce patriarchy much more than men. And understanding this actually was to me, you know, the most important turning point in actually understanding how we could influence um, development policy in the country. It was around this time that the maternity benefits bill was also amended around the same time. And that provided, you know, I'm sure most people know, six months paid maternity leave to new mothers, um, in addition to ensuring the workplace had um, a daycare and facilities for breastfeeding and so on, which I felt was the step in the wrong direction, but it had an adverse impact on employers because they got discouraged from employing women. They felt they would get married and pregnant and have babies, you know. Um, so the more I analyzed these issues in India and elsewhere, I realized that we need much more than laws to fix gender gaps. And again, I think I'm circling back to the point that Professor Mukherjee made earlier. We need actions and we need these actions um, to be actually, um, how do I say, strengthened through rights. Um, and a rights-based approach is far more fruitful in actually ensuring that policies do get implemented. Um, because what we tend to do now, I find, is that we tend to retrofit something that will un inevitably um, collapse. So what we need to do is really demolish and build back better. And one of the actions that I felt that we really needed to advance, and this was when I was working with the World uh, Economic Forum, was really to push for more representation in Parliament because we really need laws that are gender just. Um, and I had this um, small small anecdote that uh, I'd encountered of uh, in Afghanistan where uh, we were working on community-driven development and I went to a small village in Parvan, which was absolutely beautiful. And the World Bank had funded, um, they had funded an infrastructure project and the village had chosen to use their local engineer to build um, a turbine and, you know, sort of electrify their village. Except there was 
the local engineer had made terrible calculations estimating how the stream should be directed towards the turbine. So consequently, half the village got electricity from midnight to 6 a.m. And the other half got electricity from 6 a.m. until noon. And what was supposed to be 24 seven electrification actually ended up being cut in half. Um, women had purchased washing machines thinking at least we'll be able to do our laundry and so on, but they were waking up at bizarre hours to be able to do their washing and they complained bitterly uh, with the leftover money the community had decided to build a community hall and whereas the women actually wanted a maternity center because uh, for delivery because there was a lot of um, maternal mortality and infant mortality at, de uh, uh, at birth and um, there was a lot of trauma from that but somehow they had not succeeded in getting their wish. And we shouldn't be surprised because of course it was Afghanistan. But of course, it was also um, that they had not even expressed their view. And, and when I asked why, quite naively, they said, because men's wishes always prevail. Um, I could never really return to this village in Parvan to follow up and to help the women. Um, and that was because some women who were in the meeting with me had actually reported to the men about the conversation, about dissenting voices. The women who had dissented had been punished and I had been told never to come back um, and I didn't. Um, so just to conclude, um, I feel through my experience, I feel that my career basically uh, is if you connect the dots, it seems not as fractured because there is policy that sort of connects the dots between polio poverty and the search for parity. Um, but much more than that, I think um, what is very important and I, what I realize more and more is for the voices of those that we never hear to be heard and for those to be represented in higher levels more and more. Um, we do have representation in Panchayat, Riraj and so on, but what we really need is to be there in parliament. Um, working on polio and poverty has also made me consider deeply about why we spend so little on improve, improving healthcare. We all know how um, poorly budgeted it is and uh, why we also spend so little on strengthening social safety nets. Because if health was a fundamental right, there would be commensurate investment somewhere. Um, We've, we've talked a lot and during my work on polio, I discovered that several countries have the health, uh, the right to health and healthcare systems then get um, strengthened as a result. Uh, citizens, are, citizens are very conscious of that. Um, and basically that means that with the right to health, sanitation gets fixed to a large extent. Um, immunization is provided. Uh, you don't hear of vaccine hesitancy in these communities. Um, and in India, unfortunately, we sort of assume that it falls under the right to life, but I feel it needs to be out there so that there's more accountability. And um, so that's one of the things that I've thought of quite a lot and probably want to put it out there for, um, for the center to sort of think through. I mean, is there something that we can do to actually um, make the lives more secure of the place of, of communities where we work? And the second thing, and this is probably more prompted by COVID and by ex my experience of having lived in different countries, is the right to work. Um, where I feel that, um, you know, the, sorry, um, that the livelihoods missions um, and employ employment guarantee schemes basically uh, give you, offer you employment, but I think the right to work would give more security to employment. And, um, and the fragility of people's employment, uh, which was highlighted during the pandemic, where millions of workers around the world were furloughed. In developed countries, the state paid a percentage of their salaries to ensure that demand was kept high, um, savings didn't diminish and, uh, as rapidly, and the markets did not collapse. But in India, um, in sharp contrast, I found that we studied the employment numbers. Um, in April 2020, it was 24%. Um, women were the first to lose their jobs because of overrepresentation in the informal sector. Sorry to be interrupting you, Geeta. Yeah. Do I have time? I just oh. have 20 minutes in which I'll be giving my observations and okay. then take a few just, questions. 
I think you okay. can respond to questions which uh, students or others may ask. Sure. So, so that's it. I mean, I was, I was just thinking that these are things that we could think of and, um, and, and uh, probably solve the, world, the problems of the world much more effectively. So with that, I'll put it back to you. Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's been a wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Gitanjali, because these are the kind of experiences that are not often uh, debated in webinars, uh, uh, you know, of the kind that we have in academia. But your experiences are simply wonderful, very um, valuable, and I'm glad you've recorded it probably in your book. So maybe in the question round, you can take a few more questions. Uh, it's my duty now to give my comments and observations on the theme as briefly as I can, because I know students are waiting to ask questions. Uh, you know, in, the, in, in most of my research works and the last three books that uh, um, in my last three publications, I've talked about democracies, how democracies need to deliver development by increasing state capacities. This has been an overriding concern and a central question in most of my books. There are other root causes, which I believe for holding on to developmentalism as an ideology in the 21st century. This needs to be highlighted as a focal point in, in policy and development debates currently. Whether a hard state necessarily becomes an illiberal democracy is re-examined and should be re-examined in the context of developing uh, democracies. So let me uh, look at these broad questions and share some of my concerns with you, which I've done in my last three publications on democracy and policymaking in India. Now, Public policy is affected by two different worlds, the world of the normative and, of course, the world of the empirical, which is about the means or the tools of execution of policy. The normative can impact policy choices and the empirical does impact all stages of the implementation process. The debate today about ends and means in public policy is a healthy debate which all democracies need to undergo but this debate has to be context specific. The millennial generation is the next generation of policymakers. The discussion of values and philosophy of governance should be as important for them, that's debating the ends, as the empirical aspects of public policy, which of course is a critical element for the success or failure of any policy. So if public policy is all about what governments ought to or ought not to do, then the, the policy debate that lies ahead in democracies will be as much shaped by a value vision as by the sheer pragmatism that emerges from a desire to pledge to a shared goal of the continued preservation of our rights and opportunities as equal citizens. When this vision is lost, it can lead to the kind of constitutional crises or democratic deficits that are being witnessed in various parts of the developing world. The, in fact, the complex regulatory role of modern institutions in a globalized democracy, its vast ambitions in terms of social engineering today, or the economic responsibilities of a democratic state to legitimize you know, for electoral compulsions, places a democratic state constantly on the verge of delicate compromises and balances. In India, for example, our public discussion, our politics, even our sense of self and identity, constantly engage with issues of public policy. We may be aware sometimes, we may not be, but uh, that's the case. Yet, you know, the processes by which policies are made, the complex distributional issues that go into the making of sustainable policy, the ways in which today information is an input, is incorporated in the process, and in equal terms limited by vested interests, remain still very fuzzy and unclear to most citizens. In recent years, there has been a growing demand, no doubt, to unfold the, the domains of public policy to citizens and openly debate them. So therefore, public policy analysis should raise pertinent questions. The first question is, what are the knowledge maps of policymakers? 
whether it's with several actors, you know, in the governmental, non-governmental and civil society domains. We need to know what are their knowledge maps when they are making policies and what are the intended and unintended consequences of a particular policy needs to be debated and discussed. There could be structural choices, for example, is deeper economic integration into the global economy good or bad for a particular country? Is public versus private provision in health or education likely to lead to better impacts? It also applies to smaller regulatory changes which need to be debated on a day-to-day -day basis perhaps. So therefore, how do we ac acquire our knowledge and beliefs in these matters? How does an average citizen acquire knowledge? So public policy making in democracies can be incremental and mid-course corrections are possible. Look at the repeal of the new farm laws in India. That's a case in point. So public policy making in democracy can be self-corrected. Now, uh, whether a public policy is accepted if it matches the status quo or some kind of resistance is expected if opposite is the case, then what kind of assumptions do we make about state capacity in policy formulation is very important. What is the role of institutional design in facilitating or jeopardizing policy? This also is very, very important. So the broader international context that makes a policy outcome more or less likely and also the national context in which the policy will be played out needs to be looked into in policy studies today. Besides that, the rise of the South is one of the concurrent narratives parallel to the grand narrative of globalization, which will dominate world politics and economies in the 21st century. So in the 20th century, if global politics was viewed largely from a North-centric perspective, new developments today in the discipline and practice of public policy and in the sub-discipline of policy studies will be, to my mind, be largely influenced by the rise of the South in the 21st century. Inputs from the South in governance practices will influence the theory of policy studies in the 21st century. In fact, the developed South introduced development through proactive state intervention in key sectors of the economy, in human development, and state-sponsored innovations and interventions is, is a model that the South introduced. So developmentalist states are unlikely to wither away anywhere in the South, to my mind, as the concept of good governance has come to be debated more and more with the unfolding of MDGs and SDGs, which are today considered as the minimum agenda of good governance. So governing development is an ongoing endeavor in every country of the world, whether developed or developing. So you need to administer development plans, models, strategies, so that they successfully deliver their goals, which could be just public goods and services to targeted populations. So implementing all of these, the state market divide, will have to be clearly demarcated by political mandates in all countries today in this age of governance, public governance, not governments. So we have to explore the tasks and mandates of public governance in the 21st century while keeping in mind the mandates in the developing world. So what I'm suggesting is that in the post-COVID-19 era, all democracies need to renegotiate the relationship between state, society, and the rights of the citizen in the 21st century. All three generations of human rights envisaged in, in, in the Universal Declaration need to be guaranteed to citizens. And that's been well accepted in all democracies. So national resources should be used to revamp public service delivery systems to fulfill citizen needs and entitlements through the rights-based approach with a sense of fairness and justice. I say this because I do believe with a great deal of conviction that the difference between the magnetic idea of real equality, however utopian uh, that may be, and day-to-day -day perceived inequalities and injustices in any country context is the greatest cause of democratic deficits. In all democracies, this is the case, whether old and new, 
and india will be no exception to this rule so therefore uh, with these words i think uh, i conclude my observations on the theme and uh, now i'll uh, you know make the floor open for a question a brief uh, we still have 10 15 minutes maybe for a question answer round wherein uh, the audience here may ask any question to um, to the two major panelists and in case they wish to ask me a question uh, i am completely open to the idea based on what uh, i've spoken right now because i did give my comments and observations on the theme as well so i'm so open I'm to debate to and questions, questions as much as the two panelists uh, so please uh, students and teachers professors whoever uh, you know is in the audience Uh, you may please uh, ask any question but please do tell us uh, whom the question is directed to and uh, the panelist will answer your query or question professor so, yes, basu please. can i ask a question please do introduce yourself and ask the question yeah i'm um, uh, my name is sudhir uh, my question is to professor rahul mukherjee uh, yes. in fact uh, i mean after you i am the one who is teaching international relations and methods both the course <laughs> so when you were talking about it i was just thinking about the journey so a, a quick question professor sir. mukherjee you can hear you can hear what he is saying i think okay, now go, go ahead now he yeah, can now i can hear everything is fine yeah okay wonderful I, please go ahead um unfortunately i couldn't meet you when you were here so uh, my quick question is that uh, since you have uh, worked with cpr and later on you joined cps so you have been engaging with the field of policy studies as well as political science and uh, if i mean if we look at the political science syllabi and teaching learning uh, i think still there is a gap between uh, teaching political science and dealing with the policy within the discipline of political science so the politics of policy is still not the part of you know the teaching learning uh, uh, exercise in india so i would like you to comment on that aspect uh, through your experiences thank you um thank you yeah i i completely agree with you and as i said that uh because of uh having spent a fair amount of time in the policy world i had a different kind of an ability to connect the two uh because as i said to you that you know i felt lost for almost 3 years because i was not getting a teaching job but on the other hand i rediscovered myself because you know if i hadn't soiled my hands uh, i would be far more living in the ivory tower than i probably do but uh but the thing is that i you know this these are things that can be bridged and uh you know there is uh there is you can call it policy studies but a lot of what you call policy studies uh can be understood within the context of uh, international relations and comparative politics uh in fact if you if you look at the way the americans have done it there is a certain kind of work that they do which is not called public administration which is called comparative politics or international relations where they can engage through paradigms like historical institutionalism and things like that with the understanding of policy processes and then of course even in the Brit in, in britain and in the united states there is a discipline called public administration or policy studies which is uh, which connects with comparative politics and international relations uh, but uh, you know tends to leave the politics out to a greater extent in the understanding of policy processes uh, and i think there is uh, it's not just a problem that you witness i think these two worlds even in the academic world kind of run parallelly so a lot of the people who are like writing in journals like policy sciences and uh, you know whatever public administration are not citing let's say comparative politics or world politics or you know asian survey so that i mean these worlds are running parallelly but as a creative uh, person you could engage both the worlds because you know you have a ringside view of what's happening in india right uh you have you know enormous capacity to uh engage with uh, i mean for example yesterday 
this last Monday, we had a lecture by Ambassador Shamsaran uh, in my research colloquium, where he argued very, very strongly that India needs to be far more proactive in terms of regional economic integration, because that's the only way in which India can actually deal with China. Uh, not by being able to produce ports and airports faster than the Chinese can, but by actually proactively helping transit happen, by proactively enabling Bangladeshi uh, textiles to enter the Indian market, by proactively seeing that uh, regional economic integration, which will certainly not harm India, uh, can take place. Now... Uh, now, you see, I was, I, was, I was surprised because this is a former foreign secretary. He has been somewhat critical of the government. Uh, if you read the report, non-alignment 2. Point, whatever, the latest one, beyond non-alignment 2.0, you find that Sunil Kilnani, Shamsaran and others are saying that India's democracy is very important and India's institutions are very important. So they're not even talking about non-alignment anymore. They're saying that in order for India to remain an integral part of uh, the world with a certain kind of identity, it cannot succeed without its own institutions, which uh, you know are increasingly getting eroded. I mean, I uh, <laughs> I must not brag. I have not done a lot of research, but I have written a couple of very hard-hitting pieces. One was published in the Journal of Democracy. There was one in Wire. I think yesterday there are two, three other pieces that haven't yet been published, but I will get a lot of enemies <laughs> when they see the light of day. But you know, you have to engage. So I'm, 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 really, I'm really impressed that you find this to be a problem. This is actually a real problem. Uh, and, you know, the temptation should not be to just think in terms of description. I think you must uh, bring in that scholarly element where you are looking at phenomena that are very important and trying to go behind those phenomena and their causes. I think that's very important. So... A lot of you know policy scholars are living in a descriptive world, and this is happening in a lot of institutes as well. So you 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 you're just describing a lot of things, but you know from the perch that you have in JNU with your tenure and all the advantages that you have, I think you should be able to go behind these phenomena, and that this is really the difference between you and the policymaker. You see, the policymaker doesn't have the time to uh, go behind the phenomena. But you can become an astute observer and then engage with the literature to find why do people think that these phenomena happen. And then you will almost certainly come with an answer because India always provides an answer which, is, which, can, which tends to be different from the rest of the world. And that could be very fruitful for students as well as for your own career. So I'm... Uh, thank you, Professor Mukherjee. I'll have to intervene if there are... Uh... Question still, maybe we can take two more, and I'm afraid I'll have to wind up the session after that. So, if there's anything uh, directed to Dr. Gitanjali Chaturvedi, please, um, would you? Yes, yes, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, both of the presenter and uh, former CPS associates. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, my question is to Gitanjali. Uh, uh, as you uh, have the role of international agencies in developmental discourse, as an insider, uh, uh, the, 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 the role of international agencies in developmental practices and discourse, it is uh, observed that how these agencies are largely uh, dominated by the global north. And, and uh, by the intervention and the kind of uh, uh, policy making uh, they are involved in is also kind of depoliticizing the development discourse itself as john harris argues and it is a, also to sort of enjoyization of the development discourse itself so i was wondering in this context that how do you see the the very role of the developmental international agencies and you like your role as a uh, as a Academician, trained academician, as a, and and practitioners at the same times. So I would be grateful to your observations and your comments as an insider and and 
from the academics and the uh, practitioners. Yes, yes, Dr. Chaturvedi. So thank you for that question because it's an excellent question. And unfortunately, yeah. it's not uh, something that has a very short answer or crisp answer. So we can perhaps continue the conversation later. But you're absolutely right in that uh, my personal experience has been that the voices that are reflected through the work that we do in these international development agencies are those of the global north. You're absolutely right. Um, we, I, I do, uh, I mean, just to again circle back to what Professor Mukherjee said, I mean, it, it is very important for India and for the global south to find that voice. Unfortunately, what we seem to be doing to ourselves is actually d destroying the vehicles that we had actually set up for ourselves. Um, the non-alignment movement being one of them, the SARC being the second. And unfortunately, I think think for us, what holds us back is our uh, engaging conflict with our very own neighbors. And I think, and it's very good to hear uh, Dr. Saran talk about, you know, uh, about engaging more. But I think when he was foreign secretary, he certainly couldn't uh, because he was in office. Um, and, and a lot of these very creative, engaging ideas come out after people leave office where when they actually can't influence very much. But having said that, I think uh, what what is important is a rights-based approach, because at the end of it, if you are sort of professing to be a democracy and you enshrine rights that you're actually giving to your people, then you can use the development development agencies more effectively to leverage both finance, to leverage even influence, and, and to increase and improve your stature among the, you know, among the governments. I also have to say, uh, to Professor Basu's point, the global discourse has actually shifted so much to actually just focusing on China. So that's the other obsession that we see in the global north that is actually taking away the attention and also India's position that we had al already said and secured and said, okay, we are a leader in South Asia, we are an emerging leader, but I think the China discourse is something we cannot shy away from. And the models that are being presented by China, because they are of course very rich and quite, um, quite a power, um, cannot be ignored. So so we have to take that in our stride as well and actually put up a counter narrative as well in addition to what we have to do to regain that stature. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Gitanjali. I think uh, we'll have to wind up this session right now because uh, it's three o'clock already and <laughs> the next session has to begin. So with Dr. Um, Kumar's permission, um, let me... Uh, mm, I think there's no more time, Dr. Kumar. I'd better wind up this session for you because uh, you did say that we should uh, maintain the time. And uh, let me let me conclude by saying that we've had two wonderful speakers. Professor Mukherjee had so much to say about uh, his experiences in JNU. Since this is a commemorative CPS webinar, uh, it was wonderful hearing your about your journey in JNU as a student as a teacher and uh, you know the experiences speak a lot for the uh, institution of uh, uh, for the center for political studies and what it gave to its teachers as well as its students that's worth commemorating today and i'm glad that speaker after speaker in both these sessions had wonderful thing not only wonderful things to say but very thought provoking uh, things to say about what JNU does to you, the cumulative experience of being in JNU as a, if you, you'd be fortunate if you had been a student, but if you'd been a teacher as well, you, you have the double perspective and that really enriches you as uh, uh, a human being, as a, um, as a thinking human being in whichever profession you may be in. I'm glad uh, there was Professor Mukherjee speaking about his experiences as a student and teacher. And we had Dr. Gitanjali Chaturvedi's uh, very um, you know, enriching uh, experiences in the international development sector and her very thought provoking um, observations on how, uh, you know, the develop international development sector operates, you know, what are its priorities, and especially all that to, she had to say about the, the gender gaps uh, and uh, the gender parity discourse as it has evolved globally uh, was extremely interesting and thought provoking. So thank you, Dr. Gitanjali. I'm sure you will keep uh, enriching us in different fora and also writing about them in your uh, forthcoming books. So we really get the other perspective, not just the academic one, as a practitioner, as a policy implementer, as a social entrepreneur. We need to know 
you know how uh, in this age of public governance when we are talking of uh, networked governance and uh, uh, the policy inputs coming from all kinds of sectors how how has governance changed is something that needs to be recorded and talked about in different fora so thank you so much i thank both the panelists and of course i thank dr narin professor narendra kumar and his entire team for having uh, thought of this very evocative very heartwarming and very um, interesting commemorative webinar where uh, you know it's like uh, uh, you had cps tolverts uh, speaking about their experiences and uh, you know uh, yeah. though we don't though i wouldn't consider myself uh, an outsider i had been a student of jnu as well um, to be uh, chairing a session in which there was so much that i heard and which i completely shared with this was really a heartwarming experience for me to chair this session on policy and development thank you so much and i thank the panelists and the audience here for uh, being with us here in this session today Thank you, Dr. Kumar, and thank you. Yeah, your, thank I you. thank your entire team. Yeah, uh, uh, we'll have a formal vote of thanks by uh, our student Asika Di. Uh, before that, let me say that thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and uh, actually, this was a, a session wherein, uh, in fact, uh, we thought of that we'll be having uh, obviously the uh, teacher, then uh, second teacher we have uh, Ra Professor Rahul Mukherjee. and then gitanjali is someone who is a practitioner and that's why uh, this session actually was supposed to be not purely of academicians but also somebody who is in the uh, policy intervention uh, uh, i think area so that that's why i think it is wonderful to have uh, both the uh, both the opinions both the uh, sharings of uh, this particular that is policy and development uh, before that we we have the next session at 3:30 though we could have actually uh, because uh, we planned it like uh, the normally we plan it like the physical day so uh, half uh, half an hour uh, for tea uh, so please have your tea and now we'll listen to ashik ali and then we'll have the next session at 3:30 please join us there also yeah ashik please Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Political Studies, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all the honourable guests for their active participation and finding time out of their busy schedules. We men mention our deep sense of appreciation and gratitude for Dr. Dukmi Basu for chairing this ses uh, session. Uh, we sincerely thank Professor Rahul Mukherjee and Dr. Gidanjali Chaturvedi for this fantastic session for sharing the, and enrich uh, for sharing their enriching experience with CPS. sharing their research and professional journey and leading an insightful discussion we also thank our professor sudhir kumar sudha for introducing the panel of public policy and development we thank our chairperson professor narendra kumar the former and current faculty members alumni research scholars and all the students and volunteers for organizing this wonderful commemoration of cps thanks nidish for writing the report on this session thank you all once again for being with us and stay tuned uh, tuned for the upcoming session on indian politics thank you Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Kumar, and your entire team. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Unfortunately, at three thirty, I have to teach a class, which is really unfortunate because two of my very dear colleagues, whom I have seen on the screen, I will not be able to. But I hope you will record this on YouTube so that we can, uh, yeah. because I, I literally have a class, as you know, on Arindaji, so I yeah, can't. Yeah. Yeah, But, I'll be uh, there for your next session, Narendra Ji. Professor Kumar, I'll yeah. be joining you. <laughs> so thank you, thank be you. Be happy yeah. to listen yeah. and happy to join. Sure, sure. Next yeah. session as well. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.